What an amazing time to be alive, to be born in such a time as this, to be able to see what's in the scriptures, the previous scriptures. We have the Esau right here in the house of David. Now, we brought up how Israelites had to have proof they were Israelites back in the day, especially pertaining to the priesthood. So let's get that in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 64. It is on the screen. This is the book of Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 64. They saw their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore were they as polluted, pulled from the priesthood. So there is names, okay? And we'll get to that in the book of Ezra. But they sought their register and they could not find their register because everything was documented. If we are Israelites and we are still generating as Israelites, why aren't we important? Why isn't there a scribe throughout the ages been keeping record of our genealogies? We don't have scribes that are keeping record of our genealogies. Even those who claim to be Israelites, who claim to be a part of scripture, they claim to be Ezekiel, the great army that Ezekiel saw, and they claim to be prophesied in the scriptures, but yet there's no prophet among them that is putting our names in the genealogy. So now I want you to continue in verse 65. And that their Shatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things until there stood up a priest with Urim and Tamim. So until a prophet, a real prophet, okay, or a priest stood among them with the Urim and the Tamim. Because the Urim and the Tamim was this device that the children of Israel had that they had direct contact with God. But they didn't have that. So they was like, you know what? I know you say you're an Israelite. I know you claim to be an Israelite by the curses in Deuteronomy 28, but we need some proof. We need some proof. We need a prophet to come on the scene or a priest with the Urim and the Thummim. Now let's get another Scripture, okay, because this is not an island scripture. This is in the book of Ezra as well. This is going to be the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 61. This is the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 61. And of the children of the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Koz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted, put from the priesthood. Put from the priesthood. Keep going. And the Tershetha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things, till there stood up a priest with Urim and with the Mim. So until a true priest, a true prophet, stood amongst them, with the Urim and the Thummim, wasn't nothing going. Wasn't nothing happening. So now we want to go into our next topic. Today we want to talk about the Comforter. We want to talk about the Holy Ghost, which is a mystery. It is a mystery in this world. The church has no clue as into what and who is the Holy Spirit, and now we're going to find out what these Israelite camps got to say about the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Right. Jump up so we know who the Holy Ghost says. Read that. I think it's verse 18. Verse 18. I'm not mistaken. Is that what I want? Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. I will, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Christ is telling you the comforter is his spirit. Mm -hmm. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
You got people thinking the Holy Ghost is a third dude sitting somewhere talking about, hi, my name's the Holy Ghost. What's yours? No, that's the spirit of Christ. You got Muslims saying the Holy Ghost is, uh, what's his name? Muhammad. You the prophet Muhammad. The Holy Shut up! It is not. The Bible tells you the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Christ. So as you can see, these Israelite camps, they believe that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Now, that is something that is beyond ridiculous. Okay, I'm surprised by looking at this short. There's no comments at all. So I went ahead and made a comment tonight. I'm sorry. Now, let's go to a scripture that is going to completely destroy that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Because we need to know, how is Jesus going to send himself to his people? How could Jesus be the Holy Ghost? All right, let's get that. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoso speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So Jesus is basically saying that whoever speaks anything evil about him, it will be forgiven. Because at this time, they were literally calling him the devil. They were calling his works magic of the devil. OK, so Jesus had to tell them, look, whatever you say about me, it will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. So how could Jesus be the Holy Ghost according to this scripture? He cannot be. OK, this right here is what you call heresy. When someone says that Jesus is the Holy Ghost, okay, there's not one scripture where Jesus says, look, I am the Holy Spirit or look, I am the comforter. That is not true. Now we want to get to comforter. The first time comforter is mentioned in the Bible is going to be 2 Samuel chapter 10 verse 1. This is going to prove that the comforter is not a spirit. It's a person. Let's get that. And the princes of the children of Amos said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee, to search the city, and to spy it out, and to overthrow it? All right, so the comforters were the servants, okay? They were coming with condolence because the king, Hanan, his father died. So David, because him and his father, speaking of Hanan, him and his father, they both had a bond. When David was being hunted down by his own people, by King Saul, trying to kill him, it was Hanan's father that helped protect him. His name was Nahash. Okay, so now Nahash is dead, and David is honestly thinking of showing kindness to Hanan by sending comforters, by sending his servants. These were people. This wasn't a ghost, this wasn't a spook. These were actual people, and they were coming to do what? Comfort him. That is seen in verse 2. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. Now, we want to read verse 3 over again. And the princes of the children of Amos said unto Hanan, their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father? that he has sent comforters unto thee? Had not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out 
and to overthrow it. All right, so these people, okay, of Hanan's kingdom, okay, they was already thinking evil. They was like, you can't trust David. He coming here to spy it out. He's coming here to overthrow it, okay? So he was speaking ill about the Holy Spirit, metaphorically. He was speaking ill about the comforters, okay? Now, I want you to understand, this is coming from a whole different nation. Think about it. David was an Israelite. Hanan was an Ammonite. So the comfort was coming from another nation. David wasn't sending comforters from Israel to Israel. He was sending comforters from Israel to another nation. All right? So now keep that in mind. Now let's go to verse 4. Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle even to their buttocks, and sent them away. All right, so here we have this man doing evil. He's doing evil to his messengers. Now, a lot of y'all have to recall the movie, The Ottoman Empire, okay? Here you have Mehmet II. He sent comforters. He sent messengers. Okay? And expecting his messengers to be respected. Because remember, the messenger is a picture of the messenger. Okay? So the comforter or the messenger represented the person who was sending the message. Okay? So when you disrespect the messengers, you are disrespecting Mehmet because he sent the messengers. So now we got all of that in our mind. We're thinking about the movie. We sing what Vlad Dracula did. He killed the messengers, okay? He showed no regard for the messengers. Not only did he kill the messengers, but he actually impaled them, okay? The way I teach is that he forced Christianity on them. Metaphorically, that's what I seen when I seen him grab the tent peg. And I teach that the tent peg represents the cross because the original cross of the Romans was like the shape of a capital T, okay? I'm the only one that I know of that teach that Paul was killing the church with the cross going into the tent peg. So in Mehmed's day, his comforters or his messengers were highly disrespected. Okay. And as a result of that war broke out between Vlad Dracula. And this is exactly what we're about to read about. We're reading about a man wanting to show kindness to another nation, okay, and his message being disrespected, okay? So now let's keep going. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Bethrehob, and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maka, 1,000 men, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. All right, so now they know they pissed David off because David just sent, okay, the comforter to show kindness to the people and they treated it with contempt okay now we're going to let you stop right there and we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 12 all right we just talked about 
everything you say about Jesus being forgiven. But whatever you speak against the Holy Spirit, you are going to pay. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. All hell is going to break loose. So let's get that. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. So right there, he's making a distinction in between two messengers. Okay? You have the messenger, Jesus. Peace be upon him. He said, whatever you say about me, it will be forgiven. But whatever you say about this next messenger, it is not going to be forgiven. Not only in this world, but in the world to come. So let's keep that in mind as we go back to the story. Because that's all I need right there. Whatever you say about Jesus, it will be forgiven. But whatever you say about this next messenger, all hell is going to break loose. All right. So now let's get that in verse seven. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. He sent the mighty men. Now, Joab was the commander of his army. And let me tell you something. Joab was a warrior. And he sent his best mighty men, all right, because they just disrespected the comforter. Now let's keep going. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and Ishtab and Mecca were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And Joab drew nigh, and the people that were with him, unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, then fled they also before Abishai, and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon, and came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadarezer, and Hadarezer sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river. And they came to Helam. And Shobak, the captain of the host of Hadarezer, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen, and smote Shobach, the captain of their host, who died there. All right, so you got a gist of what happened. You say something against the comforter, and all hell breaks loose, okay? So now, y'all got that in your minds. So now we're going to go to another scripture. Okay, and this is going to be in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 7. This is the book of John, chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. All right, so he said it is better because that word expedient means it is better for you that I go away because 
if I don't go away, then I can't send him to you. So just look how confusing that is if a person says that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Jesus is basically saying, look, I can't do anything, okay, until this comforter comes. And it's better for you that I get out the way because if I don't go away, then I can't send this comforter. Now watch how many times he uses the word he and him. Let's get that. And when he has come. That's one time. He will reprove the world of sin. That's two times. And of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now the prince of this world. That is Israel. Israel was judged. Okay. That's why Israel needed a comforter. Now let's keep going. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. I got some stuff to tell you. If I was to tell you, you would just go jump off a cliff. Okay? Think about it. Ezra couldn't even handle how God was done with Israel. And he kept going back and forth, back and forth with the angel. There were some things Jesus could not say to Israel that only the comforter could say. Okay, that's why he said, I have things to tell you, but you ain't ready yet. You're not able to handle it. Keep going. How be it when he, that's three, the spear of truth has come, he, four, will guide you into all truth. For he, five, shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he, six, shall hear, that shall he speak. And Seven. He, and he will shew you all things to come. Eight. Keep going. He shall glorify me. Nine. For he shall receive of mine. Ten. And shall shew it unto you. And he will show it unto you. Okay. Look how many times he is mentioned. There's not no other scripture in the Bible that shows as much masculinity as this chapter. He is constantly saying he, 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 he. He's not saying me, 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 me. Okay? You taking one little I and say I send him unto you. And you're taking that and you're making an island off of it. When he's speaking of the Holy Ghost, he is speaking of someone other than himself. For the most part. All right. Now he's going to glorify me. That's going into he's going to tell the truth about me. OK, because I got to take a break real quick. I got to take a break because now we're going to deal with something. Jesus said, whoa. When everyone speaks well of you and I want you to get that scripture. This is going to be Luke chapter six. Verse 26. This is the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 26. Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. The Bible says woe. Woe. That means what? Destruction. Destruction. <laughs> Destruction. Misery. Got that right? All right, y'all. All right, y'all. It means destruction. It means misery. Okay? He says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. Now, think about it, y'all. Now, let's just be honest, okay? We're not comparing. No, we're not. We're not pinning one prophet on another prophet but let's just be honest let's just deal with reality for the most part is Jesus well spoken of yes, yes. he is well spoken of okay Christianity is the biggest religion in the world and it's all because of Jesus 
It's all because of Jesus. Jesus is well spoken of. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. Okay? Is Mohammed, peace be upon him, well spoken of? No. no. He's not well spoken of. Okay? This is facts. He is not well spoken of. Now, when we go to that scripture, it literally says, Woe unto you, and it's Jesus talking. When all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So that tells you many people lied in Jesus' name. Many people lied on Jesus because I truly believe that the real Jesus, he was not well spoken of. Okay? Now think about it. All these times, the Israelites killed the prophets. They killed the prophets. They killed the prophets. Why would they have killed the prophets if the prophets was prophesying peach and cream and saying, oh, he's going to gather you from the other end of the earth and he's going to gather you and God loves Israel. They must have been saying some things that would make you pick up a rock and kill them on the spot. Okay. And if I was to really, really meditate on it, and to think about what they must have said in order for them to be killed, I believe that they were speaking about the kingdom leaving Israel and going to another nation. That would make someone kill you, okay? And they was killing the prophets because the prophets was also prophesying of a comforter that was going to come. They didn't kill them because they was prophesying peace to Israel and God loves Israel. They must have had some bad news for Israel, okay? That'll make you just want to kill them. That'll make you just want to kill them on the spot, all right? So now, when we look at Luke 6, 26, we understand that Jesus said this so we know that they must have twisted his message and made it a cotton candy gospel. They sugarcoated it, watered it down to the point that Jesus is everybody's friend. Okay? The people who do the most wicked is best friends with the Jesus of the Bible. That tells you something happened. That tells you something happened. Now we want to get back to the comforter, okay? That was in John 16. Now we want to read John 15. This is going to be verse 26. This is the book of John, chapter 15, verse 26. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So y'all basically saying that Jesus is going to be testifying of himself when y'all saying that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Don't you need another witness besides yourself? Don't you need another witness in the mouth of two or three witnesses? Let every word be established. So y'all saying that Jesus is going to be witnessing of himself. Nobody else is going to come and confirm what he actually taught. That was the job of the comforter. That was the job of the Deuteronomy 18, 18 prophet to come and say, you know what? Jesus is not God. Jesus was not crucified. Okay. Jesus was the Messiah. Okay. Jesus was misrepresented. People lied in his name. That's what he means when he said the comforter is going to come. He's going to glorify me. Speaking of Jesus, he's going to tell the truth about me. He's going to bear witness that I chose no other gods besides the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to tell the truth. And he's going to straighten out everything that we all differ about. So, we're going to be getting into John 14, 
when I get back, we're going to get on John 14. And we're going to be talking about the comforter. And then we're going to be talking about another instance. When David sent out messengers, okay? This is going to be pertaining to Abigail, all right? We're going to deal with this situation, and we ain't rushing. I just showed you a scripture. When David sent comforters of another nation to another nation, and this messenger or this comforter was not received, it wasn't received, okay? Backing up what Jesus said. Jesus said, I pray to my father and he's going to send you a comforter. Okay, so these stories are both types and shadows of what actually happened when God sent the comforter. And you don't want to miss this broadcast. We're going to go over it and we're going to go more into detail now it's time for us to get in the word and we finna get in it. I hope y'all get in the Bible. I hope y'all study in the Bible because not studying in the Bible is going to cause you to miss out on these hidden gems that's in the Bible. So who ready to get in these scripts? We are. We are. We are. We are.